Welcome to Tales from the Fandom, a podcast that brings a special guest out of the multiverse and straight to you. And now your host, David Ginsberg. And welcome to another episode of Tales from the Fandom. Today I am joined by Danny. You might have seen her around the internet as Danny B or Danny B Cosplay or Danny B Dabbles. But I am so happy to finally get to sit down and talk with Danny today for this episode. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited to have you. It, it's always a, a great thing to find new people to talk to, especially through people that I I have talked with before. Like, I believe I found you on Instagram or on Facebook because of our mutual friend Sadie. And I think it was from a Harry Potter photo shoot. And you were totally awesome as Moaning Myrtle. Yes. Um, I actually work with Sadie and she has been a huge help as I've gotten into cosplay and um, Moaning Myrtle and Hermione uh, that Sadie does have been a lot of fun to shoot together. Yeah, it's definitely been something. I And Sadie, I, I just have to say for those people who haven't listened to Sadie's episodes that I've recorded with her, uh, definitely give her a listen. Uh, Sadie has been super supportive of the podcast ever since we got started with it. And I just have to say that it's always great to talk to people that Sadie knows because uh, Sadie's good people and therefore the people that surround Sadie are also good people. <laughs> so I guess uh, let, let's, since, you know, we're, we're talking Harry Potter to f start off with, one of your big fandoms that you're into is Harry Potter. Yeah, absolutely. I um, kind of watched the movies and stuff as a kid and through high school and through college but just recently in the last six months, um, blew through all of the audiobooks and actually exposed uh, to the books for the first time. And that has kind of reignited this passion for the Harry Potter world, really getting to dive so much deeper into those stories and find out um, how much more there was than the movies was, was really fun. That is, uh, that's something that I've been experiencing through my kids, especially my daughter because we have the movies and the kids have watched the movies many a time, but my daughter just started going through the book. She just finished Goblet of Fire. And so she wanted to watch that again last weekend. And so we watched it and she's sitting next to us and she's like, but that's not in the book. <laughs> where's, where's, where's Dobby? Where's, you know, all these things that are going on. And it's like, you know, she's, she's experiencing that whole, you can't fit everything into a movie scenario. And wow, there's been a lot of changes. Yeah, I think probably one of my greatest regrets not seeing in film was probably just any of the Weasleys interacting with the muggle world situation. So the living room fireplace, the letter with all the stamps, the phone call, all of those, I was just, I mean, cackling out loud, listening to this the book at those scenes. And so um, I, I do, I, I kind of have them so vividly in my mind, but I would absolutely have loved to see those on film. Oh my goodness. The, the amount of stuff that, uh, and you know, it's, it's a recurring topic whenever I talk to people about Harry Potter is just, I wish we could have more. I know that I've talked with people about, man, you know, it'd be great as if like Netflix or HBO or some, some, channel or streaming service was able to get harry potter and do 10 episodes per book like give us a 10 hour reimagining of the book instead of you know the two hour movie that we have yes i fully support it to uh any netflix people listening please 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 give us what we want <laughs> give it to us now now uh of course with everybody that comes in or that comes on and talks Harry Potter, the, the first and most obvious question I have to ask, it's required, it's written into like my my podcast Bible I, or something, is what house are you? I am a Ravenclaw through and through. Um, that is why I cosplay Myrtle and uh, Luna is also on my list. They are, Luna is one of my favorite um, ladies not even just in Ravenclaw, just in the entire series. So I am a proud Ravenclaw. 
That's awesome. I I am totally behind the love of Luna Lovegood. Uh, someone asked me yesterday, and they said they had asked like, "Oh, who's your favorite character?" And my number one is Neville. I just love Neville and his character growth through the whole story. But my number two is Luna because I I love what she did to like, especially you know, Order of the Phoenix is her first appearance. And it's, it's like the same time where Neville really gets his moment and they expand the trio and just add like so much dynamic to what is already there for the next like three books. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, three books, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got it right. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not hard. Right <laughs> that, that's, that was brought up. My, my daughter was like, why are there eight movies and only seven books? I said, yeah, they, they split one. And I'm thinking of that right now. I'm like, wait a minute, is, is it three books? Yeah, it's three books. Okay. Yeah, I, I am not mistaken. So you blew through the audiobooks. Which did you, uh, who did you listen to for the, the reader, just out of curiosity? Uh, Jim Dell. Okay. He was absolutely phenomenal. Yes. I think I've, I think I listened to those. Um, because I've I've got the books and I've got the movies and I did listen to the audiobooks at one point years and years and years ago, and yes, very funny. I like his Hermione, oh my, his Hermione and his Myrtle versus Myrtle voices both just cracked me up. Oh, it's always so good, good stuff. Which uh, which book? Uh, now that you have gone into the the deep dive that is the books, uh, which book do you find is your favorite? Oh gosh, okay, um, that's such a a hard such a hard choice because I blew through the books so quickly that they all do run together. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Order of the Phoenix is the one that I had the most trouble when I get somewhere in my car, because I largely listen to them in my car, I'd have the most trouble getting out and going inside because I wanted to sit there and I wanted to listen more because I was so engrossed. Um, so I would probably default to Order of the Phoenix. Okay. That is that is one of my favorites. It's either, it's usually Prisoner of Azkaban is that first one and then then Order of the Phoenix. But yeah, it's it's definitely that that one where it's like, man, there's just so much going on. And you're like, I think, I feel like, between Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix is where you get that dump of like so much Harry Potter lore and backstory and what's yes. going on and how it's like been building to like these key moments. Yes, I loved Prisoner of Azkaban as well. So we got your favorite person, which is Luna Lovegood. We got that you're a Ravenclaw. We got that you're you like the Order of the Phoenix book. Does it differ for the movies? Because you watched the movies first. Did you have a favorite movie? I would I would tend to say that's a tough choice for movies because I'm a movie nut and I genuinely just enjoyed the movies as a whole. I'm gonna be cliche and say all of them. <laughs> I like I like all the movies. Um I will say that I think Goblet of Fire was my least favorite movie compared to the book. Now that I also um, have gone through the books, mm -hmm. there were just so many differences. Yeah, that that's the one that we watched last weekend. And I told my wife afterwards, I said, I don't know how, how many more times I can watch the Harry Potter movies, not because I don't love them because I do, but I've seen them so many times. And then during like rereads, you're like, they really missed missed the mark on this, or they shouldn't have cut that, or I wish this had been done differently. Like the whole uh, the end of like the the end of the scene, or during the the final challenge in the maze, it's just so incredibly different yes. from what you you read. And it's like, oh gosh, this is just like ferrying them to Voldemort. Like it's not having anything at all going on except you know there's vines and there's wind. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the, the book gives that such a more kind of vivid and, and um, exciting and involved portion of that, that challenge. And so it's so weird to kind of just see it jump. Exactly. And I, I love my Harry Potter fandom. And I love that you have, uh, of almost everything here, every the all the fandoms that we're going to talk about today, like Harry Potter is the one that's not owned by, by the mega mega fandom owner that is disney <laughs> correct it's true but sometimes i wish it was because i wish 
Harry Potter world was at Disney somewhere. I agree. It makes Orlando trips very difficult for me having to choose. I know, and I live here, and it's like, I really wish I could just buy one ticket to go somewhere. Or I wish, I wish, you know, best case scenario, I wish Harry Potter world just existed on its own. Yes. And then I, then I would just be a pass holder to that. That, that, uh, that sounds like a plan. I still have never actually been to Wizarding World, either of them, because every time I end up with a free date in Orlando and I'm, I, I think about it and I think about it, I still end up at Disney. Well, uh, honestly, like that's that's the thing, especially um, with my family, is that there's so much more to do when you go to Disney. When you go to like Universal, uh, it just depends. Like my family doesn't ride roller coasters, so mm -hmm. all the roller coaster rides are immediately out. And then even then, it's like there's there's still not. I mean, I I and I love Universal. I really do. But a lot of the rides that I used to love aren't there anymore, and I don't go often enough to fall in love with new ones. When when my wife and I went uh, to Harry Potter World for our anniversary at Universal, all we did was people watch and drank butterbeer <laughs> because the Hogwarts Castle ride was closed, oh. um, and we rode we rode the uh, the Hogwarts Express between the two the two parks, and then the line was too long for the um, the Gringotts Bank ride for the the amount of time we had. So we we honestly we got our butter beer, we sat down, and we people watched. <laughs> that uh, that still sounds like a pretty good day. It is, and you know, it's it's. I, I will say it's super immersive. Like once you go in, it's like you know, it's it's Harry Potter as if you you're not existing in Orlando, except for the the terrible terrible heat. Yeah, there is that. It's always up. Oh my gosh! Yes, <laughs> I think today is supposed to be almost ninety degrees. It's like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to go outside anymore. Oh my goodness! Not only you're you're Harry Potter, but are you into like the Fantastic Beast movie series? Are you more like, eh, I could do without it? Like, what's your stance on that? I am a huge Eddie Redmayne fan as an actor. Um, so I have thoroughly enjoyed the Fantastic Beasts movies i think that um he's a really good fit for newt and so it, it makes them um really believable and lovable and awkward and i relate to that on a uh, deeply spiritual level just awkward nerdness um and so i think i i enjoy those movies a lot i i definitely have to agree and i know that one of the common refrains that i hear when i talk to people is that it's nice that we have a a hero character like Newt where he's socially awkward and and not only is that like he's not like the the stereotypical like Gryffindor person he's like he's straight up Hufflepuff he's like the kind sensitive guy he just wants to take care of his animals you know like that type of thing and then you also get like the the wonderful character because I love Jacob like Jacob was my guy I was like, there, there's, there's the person that I can dress up as right there is Jacob. <laughs> I do. I love, I love Jacob so much. And his just fascination, not only his fascination with everything, but I think his willingness to just every new thing that they throw at him. He's like, okay, sure. Yeah, this looks fun. Exactly. It's like, oh, you know, he just kind of accepts like that there's magic. And well, what, let's, let's, let me just see what it's all about. Like, it's so cool. I mean, if somebody said that there's magic to somebody, you know, in, in the real world, I, I would imagine that it would not be the same kind of response. No, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, as much as we, even those of us that are in these magical fandoms like Star Wars and Harry Potter, if somebody came up to us and really, you know, made a spell happen or turned on a lightsaber, I, I think, I don't think we would know what to do with ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> probably like just our minds would explode and it would take moments if not minutes to be just to to comprehend and be like i can't believe you just showed me what you showed me yeah just like total not process mind blown yeah exactly now you, you bring up another fandom which you know we, we and i think i talked about the other one for a moment but 
uh the uh, one of the other big ones that you're into because you're you're in like the big trifecta of of pretty much like the the hot three which is uh harry potter and then the next one which is a really long-running fandom is star wars yes absolutely star wars is probably top fandom for me life consuming how did you get into it what was like what was your first exposure to star wars um, just as a kid, for as long as I can remember, we've, we watched the original trilogy in our house, um, and was always such a huge fan, not necessarily, I think a lot of little girls say they grow up wanting to be Princess Leia. I grew up wanting to be an Ewok. That was my favorite and I loved them. And I just only ever wanted Ewoks. That was my thing. Ewoks and droids. So all, all the, uh, all the Halloween costumes were fluffy little teddy bears. <laughs> did you grow up also watching like the uh the ewok cartoon or the droid cartoon yes and um the ewok and droid cartoons and um the whole um i have little i don't even know how old they are but i have um old ewok and droid uh comics and books and that sort of thing i remember watching those uh it's it's so incredibly funny like looking back on on history especially for for me and my relationship to star wars because i remember playing with the action figures in i'd say like the mid to late 80s so i'd play with the action figures i remember playing with a millennium falcon ship but i never watched star wars until i was probably in middle school and it wasn't something that grabbed me at the moment and it took it took a couple tries and then finally i did get into it and i was like oh yeah i love star wars and then down the rabbit hole of uh, of what is now called like the legacy legacy books or old school expanded universe and that was it for me yeah absolutely i was only nine when phantom menace came out so our whole family went to go see it together even my little brother was six at the time and we all went to see Phantom Menace and it kind of then the prequel trilogy, we got to all experience together um, as like new Star Wars fans, not not just having to watch them at home on video. Oh my goodness, nine. And here I am thinking, <laughs> I was double that uh, in college. And I think I saw Phantom Menace. Let me think. I think I saw it nine times in the theater, 10 times. And, you, you know, the, especially with how fandom is and Phantom Menace, there was definitely that period of time where it's like, oh, man, Phantom Menace is like the worst and it's a terrible movie. And then now it's kind of getting that. I feel like there's a, a resurgence of, you know, Phantom Menace has its good points and we, we, we will honor those and love those. And I, I think I think a lot of the split is maybe almost generational. I think it's those kids that grew up with Phantom Menace and that was their Star Wars and the pod racing and the goofy Jar Jar. Those kids are now at the point where we're old enough to speak up and we're, we're a large portion of the fandom now. And so I think that's part of that resurgence is just those kids that that was their movie. They're growing up and they're the voice now. Right. And uh, isn't it uh, that this year is the... 20th anniversary of Phantom Menace. It is. And we actually, uh, we were just at Star Wars Celebration in Chicago and we got to attend the 20th anniversary panel um, and kind of get some of that behind the scenes and listen to the stars talk about it. And that was a lot of fun. That is really cool. I And I have to say, okay, so I, I, I watched original trilogy all the time on videotape and then saw all the the prequels in the theaters like i i understand like the the gripes that people have especially with with some of the stuff in the in the prequels but at the same time it's like it's fun i mean no one's ruining your like the i i guess you know getting into the twitter the twitter verse of <laughs> you can only let people ruin it if you let people ruin it for you like you're you're in control of what you like or don't like and if you don't like it that's fine but you don't need to be like no one should like it you know that that kind of like pitchfork mentality of either it's it's my way or the highway stop ruining my stuff 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think even as a fan, when you sit down and you have time to watch a Star Wars movie or you have time to watch two movies, you get to pick which two movies you watch. If you don't want to watch episode one, don't watch episode one. But, you know, um, one of my favorite moments of, of Star Wars watching was when when The Force Awakens was released in theaters, I went um, to a marathon of all six movies and then they showed force awakens so that was my first time getting to see um the original trilogy in a theater and um just getting to watch it with fans and and the cheering and the you know just even a room full of fans clapping for the pod racing and cheering mm -hmm. you know it was so fun and it was a lot of um it was a lot of fun just getting to experience all of the movies with the with fellow fans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I have to say that one of the things that, you know, Phantom Menace has that probably can't be said yet for, for like the, the new trilogy, the, the, the sequel trilogy is that Phantom Menace left that piece of music, Duel of the Fates that is still used all over the place. Now, like you constantly hear it and it's like, I love hearing that piece of music just wherever they they get to plug it in yes and i i duel of the fates is also one of my absolute favorite um musical scores from the entire series and and darth maul is, is just kind of one of my favorite baddies so i think just kind of the epicness of of darth maul and his music and his moment it was just it was so good so for for Star Wars, you grew up on Phantom Menace, but you've seen all of them. I'm I imagine you've seen all the movies, right? Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yes, very much so. Several times, many times. Um, I do want to to, you know, ask the hard hitting question of which movie is your favorite? Um, episode five, no doubt. Don't tell the Ewoks. <laughs> oh, that is so good. I love jokes. jokes <laughs> Ewok jokes are even better. If if I if I only have time to sit down and watch one, I'm usually putting in uh, episode six, but episode five is my favorite. Okay, what is it about uh, Empire that you love the most? I think just um, just so much story goodness and and character changes, and I think I just think that that one from beginning to end is, is the best. It's not, you know, I don't think it's, it's as goofy as some other moments, certainly not as goofy as Ewoks, but um, it just, it's so pivotal to the story and so well done um, that that one has always stood out to me. I like it. I like, I've always liked Empire from, from when I saw it, you know, obviously there's Yoda and Yoda's cool. And then you get like this expanded group of people that you're like, oh, look, there's bounty hunters. And there's this guy named Lando Calrissian. And apparently he owned the Millennium Falcon before Han Solo. And what's their story? You know, you get yeah. in, you get that movie that just expands what you know. And then now it's like breadcrumbs. You got to follow the breadcrumbs. And then, then you're like, well, let me try to find more information about this or this. And, the, and is those are, those are the movies where I, I love just getting just so much background and story and characters. And then you can start like trying to piece things together. How did that work? What's up with that? Give me more information. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that's, I think kind of inter interweaving bits of story and, and, tiny little Easter eggs that come back later is something that um, Star Wars in general has done really well. And especially with going back and doing prequels and origin stories, they've kind of answered a lot of those questions that we had in the original trilogy. And that's been cool to see those pieces fall in line. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, following up on favorite movie is, do you have a favorite character? Hmm. I would probably, I have several favorites for different reasons. I think, you know, um, my, my current uh, pick would probably just in general be 
Ray because she is kind of this powerful character for this generation of girls growing up and they see that lead female kicking butt and taking names and that, I think that's something that's really empowering in any fandom lately is just seeing all these powerful females come to the front and I love seeing that I think if I if you know if we're talking merchandise or something or art um, my favorite is always going to be droids R2 C3PO um, even BB-8 those are those are top of the list for me most of the merch and um, decor and things that I own I I designed a R2-D2 engagement ring, like it's it's all droids for me in my life. My car is BB-8, <laughs> um, so we we have a very droid filled home. <laughs> you welcome the droids in your establishment. We do. Their kind is always welcome. Always. You know, obviously. Uh, okay, wait, hold up, just a second. Um, so we have this year episode nine coming out. Yes. And after episode nine, and I've been reading some of the stuff that's been coming out of Disney Star Wars, is that I know that Ryan Johnson, and I, I swear I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, that he's got like movies that aren't connected. So they're going to be like a separate duology or trilogy or something. What would you like to see if you were in charge of, of some movies? What what kind of Star Wars movies would you like to see focused on? Well, I think that if I were put in charge of Star Wars movies, we'd end up with remakes of um, Battle for Courage and um, and or um, sorry, Battle for Endor and Caravan of Courage. I mean, I would I would honestly just you know love <laughs> love Ewok movies. You know, that's clearly um, that's what would happen if they put me in charge. But I think really and truly, I, I would love to see kind of going back to almost sort of um, these, the movies that I think Rogue One and Solo kind of really captured the spirit of putting a mm -hmm. Solo. I mean, we did know those characters, but it, it felt like a different movie, I think. And, and Rogue One especially, it felt like it wasn't characters we necessarily knew, but it still felt Star Wars and it just kind of gave you a look at other parts of the galaxy. And so I hope that the new movies where wherever they're set or whatever characters they feature really capture kind of giving us more immersion into that world and understanding the differences of other planets um, and other kind of audiences or species or worlds to kind of see more and more of developing what's possible across the galaxy. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it, as, as a star Wars fan growing up, um, and you know, I know that you watch Phantom Menace when you're nine, um, it's definitely, there was a time where it's like, I'm never going to see another star Wars movie in the movie theater. And now we are in this, time that we're living in where it's like yes we get to see a star wars movie almost every year in the movie theater and now they're going to have tv shows of star wars on uh, the disney streaming service yeah absolutely i'm i'm super excited for the streaming service and to see what all they have coming but i think Ultimately, you know, maybe we'll get lucky and they'll bring back Mara Jade. That's still my hope that I'm going to hang on to for every movie. You're a Mara Jade fan? I am. I'm a huge Mara Jade fan. Um, I'm a Timothy Zahn fan in general, and I, I love the Thrawn books. And and um, I love the, the character um, of Mara and just kind of the powerful female that she is. That kind of goes back to, you know, what, what I find endearing um, and empowering. So I, I do. I love Mara Jade, and I'm going to keep hanging on hope that she sneaks her way in. They don't have to call her Mara Jade. You know, they can you know, give her whatever name they want, but give me that character. Give me that awesome female who works her way up through the ranks and, and takes command. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you can't see me, and the people that are listening eventually when, when they're listening to this episode can't see me nodding. But I'm nodding along because I really like Mara Jade. But I know that my my personal favorite character cannot ever be seen in, in the movies or TV series because of how they redid canon. But my love, Jaina Solo, uh... I will carry your torch. <laughs> 
I do. I love uh, I love Jaina as well. I'm so sorry for your loss. <laughs> It it is okay. It, it's something I, I will I will be honest that when they when they said you know what we're going to 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 shuttle the expanded universe into like its own area and we're going to focus on other stuff, I, I was bitter for for a good year or two, and <laughs> I, I was like, but I love these characters, like because not only do I love Jaina, but I love Wedge Antilles and yes. the 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 character development in all the books that he was featured in it's just there's just so much and i understand i understand that disney had to do what disney needed to do for star wars and streamlining and getting everything in what they wanted laid out but dang it i want my peeps <laughs> i i agree I, I can see both sides of the coin but i still selfishly want my side of the coin Absolutely, but I I am excited about the the Disney Plus streaming service. I mean, we're we're talking about Star Wars and all these different shows like The Mandalorian, and they're doing like a Cassian Andor show with K two S O is going to be in it, and like all this other stuff that they could potentially do. And they're talking about like a Knights of the Old Republic TV series, and and they're re bringing back Clone Wars, and you know, like all of this great stuff and. You know, a couple of years ago, you'd never think that would, would ever happen. Yeah, absolutely. So much, so much new Star Wars goodness. And I think because for so long it's been driven by movies, the idea that we're going to get all this rich new content on the small screen is is equally exciting because it kind of gives us more and more look, more and more of a look into into the breadth that is Star Wars and um, I think in the past where we've kind of been limited to books and using our imagination, we get to actually see these things brought to life as a director imagines them. So that'll be really exciting. And that's one of the reasons I think I'm most excited about the Galaxy's Edge Park opening is just to finally get to put yourself into Star Wars, you know? Oh my goodness. It It is, it is a, a double-edged sword for me living here in Orlando because... I really want to go, but it's it's hot when it when it's going to open. I think it opens in September here, and it's going to be really hot. And then they show you those like nice, pretty pictures of, oh, this is how the park is going to look <laughs> like, and and here's here's like the the ten or twelve people or twenty people like milling about, and I'm like, that is not ever <laughs> ever going to be the case of going into that park i can't imagine going even in its like first year as as badly as i want to go going in the first year of it being open will be ridiculous so i am fully ridiculous and since last year we have had our trip booked for december uh not knowing when the opening dates would be so we planned for uh mid-december and i am so so excited to go um I know that they'll only have the one Millennium Falcon ride open when they first open on Labor Day weekend. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. by our December trip that we get the Rise of the Resistance ride as well. Oh, I will cross my fingers for you. I, I've heard so many good things from the people that have gotten like that inside information about how things are going to be handled inside the park. And I just, I cannot wait. <laughs> Absolutely. I am um, Galaxy's Edge had a booth at Star Wars Celebration. And so we got to go back each day and see like a kind of a different part. So one day was lightsabers and one day was droids and one day was um, merchandise. So it was, it was a lot of fun to keep going back and see what, you know, what's going to be in the park. Well, that is really cool. I, the, uh, the one thing, on, so on top of the, 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 um, the park i'm really excited for when that hotel opens up that's supposed to be like super immersive yes of course we'll have to go back for that yes and i, I imagine it's going to be a very very expensive hotel room for however many days that people need to to be there yeah hopefully they'll uh, they'll take a year off from celebrations so i can actually have enough money to go somewhere else for a while <laughs> So, so we're talking, obviously, you know, Star Wars. Star Wars is owned by Disney, and Disney is that third big, uh, big fandom of yours. Yes, I love um, not only Disney movies, Disney characters, Disney parks. I'm there. I'm there for all of it. Well, I guess, I guess, you know, did 
did you get into Disney when you were a kid? Like most, most, you know, kids do, you know, there's that whole, here's a Disney movie, watch it, entertain yourself. <laughs> of course. Um, mine, ours growing up was um, Cinderella. I wore that tape out, but not, not like most little girls for the princesses. I was absolutely and wholly in love with the talking mice and they were my favorite part of the entire movie. And I just wanted to watch Gus Gus again. And so I'd rewind that tape and put it back in. And, and I, I still just have such a heart for the animals of Disney. I think there's a theme here. I, I really like animals and droids and weird uh, non-human things. <laughs> <laughs> which uh which which movie I, I and you know it's it's tough there's a lot of disney movies but which which movie do you love the best what is your disney movie hmm. i think from animated perspective as an adult i would probably classic animation i would probably go with beauty and the beast okay i think New school Disney, I would probably, hmm, I really enjoyed, I have really enjoyed the, Disney Pixar still counts, right? Disney Pixar? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So I would say I really have enjoyed the the Toy Story series in general. Um, I love so many of those characters and and cannot wait for number four to come out. I, I'm really interested to see, because, you know, at, leaving off at three it's like okay you get like that sense of completion and but now with four i'm very curious to see just where they're going to go with it and what it means for like the toy story franchise in general but they they haven't really done as far as picks like you know disney pixar goes haven't really done wrong in most of their movies agreed i, I think they've been well done in general, and I have loved so many of them. I love, um, I also love The Incredibles and, and even um, having our Incredibles so long ago and then coming back out with Incredibles 2 so much later um, was interesting to kind of see that same fandom span two generations of kids. Although, you know, our generation of kids was also in that theater really excited to see The New Incredibles. So, um, and maybe that's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of branching with Toy Story and Incredibles and all these spaced out timelines. I think we're kind of almost seeing that that Star Wars generation spanning fandom kind of come back and where multiple generations are able to share the same joy and the same love of characters is really cool. It is. It's something where I know, um, you know, as a as a dad to my three kids it's it's definitely interesting to see what they gravitate towards um and i try to steer them in the direction that i would like them to, to be steered in versus some of the other animated stuff that they they ended up watching and i'm like oh can we can we go back to some of this good stuff over here <laughs> and i know one of the other discussion topics has always been with the, the the new live action reimaginings because they they saw the new Cinderella, they saw the new Beauty and the Beast, and now you know Dumbo is currently out. We have Aladdin coming out, we have Lion King coming out, and it's it's introducing like my I guess my kids' generation if they haven't already been immersed in Disney yet, like they're getting these new live action movies to pull them in. Yeah. I have, I, I think that the idea is, is really cool. I have some strong and proper, probably unpopular opinions on some of the live action remakes. I think the idea of reintroducing kids to the, to these movies is really cool. It is. I'm, I'm very curious to see, because I've heard, and I know like Mulan is in production and, and a lot of these other like major ones are, are being looked at and, I found a meme the other day about about the live action Disney movies. It's like, can we please have like a live action Atlantis movie or a live action Treasure Planet movie? Can we please have that? Yes, I am. I am of that school of thought. I I don't understand. Uh, at the risk of heresy here, I don't understand 
calling this live action Lion King remake live action because it's all still CG. We just <laughs> threw a bunch of money at something that didn't need to be updated. But that's uh, if if they do truly, I saw an article this week that there is a lot of rumors that they've cut Be Prepared. And if that happens, I am prepared to riot. Oh, my. I, I, I did not know that. The rumor is that many of the original songs from Lion King have been cut, and that is devastating to me. Wow, I, I'm kind of shocked over here. I, because I, I, of of the remakes, um, Lion King wasn't one where I was like, okay, yeah, that that'd be something. Because obviously, animals, and they they did fine with Jungle Book. Yeah. It, it wasn't something where I was like pounding down the door to see. But I I think I eventually watched it on Netflix, but. I mean, I'm down with like Beauty and the Beast and and Mulan and Aladdin and seeing how those are turned out because there's people in them. But it it is the same the thing that you said uh, is that it's not live action because it is just CGI animals. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I I still haven't watched Cinderella because as my childhood um, attachment to the animated Cinderella movie, I'd rather not know how the new mm -hmm. one was. But um, I've seen all the rest and the Beauty and the Beast and the Jungle Book. They were they were all good. I'm super excited for Aladdin. I think that one is a really good fit for a live action remake. And all of the effects and the costuming and the colors are just gorgeous. And I'm so, so excited to see how that one turns out. I am too. And I, I think I just read something about like Jasmine's costumes throughout the, the show or throughout the movie and how they change and evolve and how they're trying to like reflect different, like, Oh, in this one, she has to be like prim and proper. So that's why they had to do like this kind of costume and make sure that it had like these features. And then they weave like that, that's uh, that teal or the, the aqua ish uh, color that she had in the original movie, how they kind of like subtly blended in, in places. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see it. It looks so fun. So let's see here. You're, you're a Disney movie person. Did you all... So let's see here. You were nine when Phantom Menace came out. Were you were you old enough for, like, the Disney afternoon cartoons? Like, Rescue Rangers? And, or was that... Did you miss that? I'm trying to think. So, you might have been too young for that. As far as an, um, TV itself, we didn't watch much um, in our house. We watched a lot of movies. I was introduced to um, Monty Python at a very young age, which was probably a mistake on somebody's <laughs> part. Um, but I, I watched a lot of movies and not a lot of TV shows. So I'm still catching up on a lot of classic TV. Okay. Well, did the uh if if they were paying me to promote this, they wouldn't have to try very hard for me to talk about it. But the Disney Plus apparently is going to have like all those great Disney cartoon animation shows on the service. Yes, I'm so excited for all that Disney Plus will hold. I think um like I need I need another subscription, like I need another hole in the head, but um I I just I love I'm excited for all of the Disney, even the old Disney original cheesy movies. I loved those movies. So I'm uh, I'm excited to get, get a hold of all of that once that service is out. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I will highly recommend, if if it's on the service, because I saw the, the show list and it wasn't on there. But if you get a chance and it's on, definitely watch Gargoyles because it's great. Okay, I do vaguely remember Gargoyles. Yeah, Gargoyles was uh, late, mid to late 90s, I think. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's, and it's got a lot of Star Trek people in it, which, you know, Star Trek is not on your list of things, but <laughs> it's got Star Trek people in it and recognizable voices. Okay. All right. But great show. Uh, and of course, like Rescue Rangers and Darkwing Duck and DuckTales and... It, there's good stuff. There's lots, lot, lots of good stuff. I did watch more of the recent DuckTales because David Tennant was one of the voices, and I'm a huge Doctor Who fan as well. Yes, I, I think I've watched one or two of them, um, and I think it's more of a. I grew up on like the original DuckTales, so it's hard to to go with the the animation style, sure. but it's definitely something where I want to. Uh, circle back to it and watch it at some point and be like, yay, DuckTales, because I, li I like that character. I like the voice actors in it. 
let's see. So uh, we got some Disney movies out of the way <laughs> and Disney parks because you're coming to coming and visiting in December and hanging out at the Disney parks. And you'll be watching some Disney Plus when that comes out <laughs> and adding another hole to your head. <laughs> um. So and we and Star Wars falls under Disney. Harry Potter does not, um, which is fine. But I wish they were in the same park. We talked about that. Uh, but the the thing which brought us together, and as we started off the beginning of the episode, is cosplay. Yes, absolutely. How how did you decide to get into cosplay? Like, what was the that f- motivating factor? So growing up as such a Star Wars fan. Um, the 501st Legion, actually, its founder is in Columbia, South Carolina. So we're kind of where I'm at in South Carolina is home base for a lot of the Star Wars costuming groups. And so I had friends in high school and college. They were older friends, but they were they were a stormtrooper. And I thought it was so, so cool that they got to do Star Wars events and Um, that they got to make official Star Wars costumes. And so um, growing up, I had kind of always wanted to be in the 501st Legion. And then eventually the Rebel Legion came about. And so kind of, to me, the only character that I really related to as a female was Leia. And I didn't really want to do the white dress Leia costume. And so kind of once these this new set of Star Wars films came out, I really resonated with Ray, and I finally was like, okay, I could make this costume. I really want to do this. And so I kind of jumped into Ray costume to apply for the Rebel Legion. And then once I got approved in the Rebel Legion in April of last year, just a year ago, um, it has been a slippery slope ever since, and I've kind of <laughs> cosplayed any and every character I can get my hand on. I have to say because I, I know the and like I know of the five hundred first and the Rebel Legion and like the Mandalorian, you know the the whole group of the Star Wars the that that costuming group set, and I have to say like going for an official like getting recognized by by that level of group is super hardcore like that that's something where i know that they they go down to like the nitty gritty on details before they give you approval right yes that is um typically fabric types making sure every seam is in the right place that all your colors are specific it's it's really in depth and i I think and sometimes i think the legions can can get a bad rap a little bit i think sometimes the the standards um, people kind of, some people can come across as elitist or, or judgmental, and and that's certainly there's bad apples in every group. But I think that on the whole, the when you consider that the Rebel Legion and the Five Hundred First Legion, they are volunteer and charity costumers. We're doing this of our free time, and and we enjoy going to the children's hospital and the community events and representing these characters. That's why we're held to the standards we are. It's because we are, you know, Lucasfilm is allowing us to exist for these reasons. I think that it it makes the effort and the time and the countless hours of sewing and dyeing fabric and and all of that worth it. Mm-hmm. It, it is something. I know I was looking, I think I was looking at somebody's Facebook page previously, and they were talking about like a Stormtrooper kit and how much, it runs just to get the materials <laughs> before like assembly and all the blood, sweat and tears that goes into to getting it all prepared and ready. And it's definitely something where it's like a chunk, it, it, especially I guess with certain costumes, it is that a big investment to to be able to be a part of it. But at the same time, you're doing so much like good out there in in the world of like just giving back and positivity and doing stuff and i know like my kids have interacted with uh like 501st members and rebel legion members at various events and it's always been such a positive uh, a positive uh like attitude positive uh environment for them it's it, it really is so fun to see the the faces of of kids and adults alike light up when 
a Darth Vader or their favorite character walks into the room and they get so excited. It's a joy to be able to bring that level of excitement and happiness and magic to somebody. So you got in through Star Wars, which which is like that one of the big gateway fandoms of of costuming. And you said you went down this slippery slope. What what happened next? I believe my second costume was the 13th Doctor from Doctor Who. I was so excited to finally have a female doctor that um, I put some time and effort trying to get all the right costume pieces. And we had a, a big um, local cosplay meetup the next month. And so I kind of threw it together and went out there and had a really good time. And there was there was no going back from that. So then it, it devolved into other Doctor Who costumes, Harry Potter costumes, more Star Wars costumes. Um, <laughs> so kind of nonstop, some Disney costumes, things of that nature. What is it about what is it about cosplay that makes you want to sacrifice not only your time but your your money and your blood sweat and tears into doing these costumes? I think it's it's a little bit of two things. One is certainly the friends and the relationships that I've built because of costuming and it's something that I share with my friends and we all dress up together and we go out and it's a really fun time together. Um, and then I think kind of the flip side of that is I grew up in theater. I love acting. I love being a character. I love kind of just getting to not be yourself for a little while and just getting to be somebody else and have fun. Moaning Myrtle. <laughs> how did you, how did you decide that you wanted to, to do Moaning Myrtle besides the obvious Ravenclaw connection? So I have a very round face. And many of the characters that I cosplay have kind of long, skinny, thin faces. And so when I was watching back through Harry Potter recently and kind of just had this connection of, I kind of, I, I think I could pull off Myrtle and I'm really good at complaining and whining. And, um, and I think, um, Sadie might have been the first um, one to point out to me that I, I could pull off Myrtle really well. So I, I, got, I got the mask, or I, I went out and I, I got the wig and I got the glasses and I kind of played around with some makeup and I was like, okay, this could work. And um, so I then, then I made the robe and the dress and that was, that was a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun with Myrtle. <laughs> Yeah, it those pictures, I mean, there's just something where it's like it just it just it captures you and you're like cuz pe when people are doing cosplay, that's not one of the characters that are, <laughs> are that people are doing. You don't see people doing Morning Myrtle and but you did this incredible Morning Myrtle. Thank you. Thank you. I I genuinely love Myrtle. I think she's she's so fun and I think she's underappreciated and kind of getting um, reading into more of her, her backstory and her unfortunate demise. Um, I think she, she's just a lot of fun and she's underappreciated and she deserves some love. She does. She's definitely, it, it's, it's just, she's just that character to, that you just want to be like, Oh, Myrtle, I'm so sad for you, but wow. Like Myrtle, you're, you're, you're extra special today. <laughs> Like stop creeping on on people in the in the bathroom. <laughs> she uh, she has some issues, but uh, <laughs> we love her anyways. So you how how long have you been cosplaying since the the start of the stormtrooper era or not stormtrooper but the Star Wars? Actually, cosplaying as an adult, um, April of 2018 was kind of when I jumped in. Um, other than that, it's just kind of been Halloween costumes and. and things like that, that I've thrown together for costume parties, but, um, truly cosplaying and actually sewing just over a year. Okay. One of the things that I'm looking, cause I'm looking at your Instagram right now and I'm just scrolling through and I love like your, your aerial array with like your flounder BB eight, which is super cool. And, uh, your character from Incredibles two, and you do spider Gwen and, you, you've done just a, a number of characters just across the spectrum of fandoms. I think um, I, I have the maybe blessing, maybe curse of loving so many things. 
um, I'm, I'm a mess because I'm all over the place. I think uh, I, I, can't, I can't go watch any new movie and, and not go, oh, I want that costume. I think it's become, <laughs> it's become a, um, I'm almost a, a kleptomaniac for, for different crazy costumes, you know. Um, even just seeing Avengers, I, I, want, I want the new suit. I want, um, I don't even know what character I would, I would put in it, but I, I just want the new Quantum Realm suit. They're so slick, slick and the white and the red. They look so cool. Um, but even when we went to see, you know, Mary Poppins last year, I, I couldn't resist. Um, we left the theater and I told my husband, I was like, we're going to be Mary Poppins and Jack. Those costumes were so good. So I think um, I'm, I'm a hopeless, I'm hopeless. I go see anything and I want the costumes. I like that you're, uh, you're, you mentioned your husband. I like some of these pictures that you've gotten with him. Uh, is, is he a willing cosplay, uh, I guess, partner in crime with you? Or do you have to say like, oh, can you please do this? Or is it more like, you know, that he's just ready to do what you need him to do? <laughs> I think it, it very, very much depends on how much he likes a character. Um, so... The Han Solo and Kira that we do together, he loves Han Solo. He wanted that new young Solo jacket and look, and that's what he wanted to do. So that that's not as much of a problem. He absolutely loves his Bith musician costume um, that he's kind of just put together. And he has so much fun going out in that and kind of being a goofball because nobody can mm-hmm. see his face. So he gets to have a little more fun with it. But some of, some of the other ones uh, where I drag him into the couple's cosplays, he is not as excited about, but he is, he is a willing, albeit barely willing participant most of the time. <laughs> now, what, uh, what do you have on the horizon as far as cosplay um, plans go? So... For Dragon Con this year in Atlanta over Labor Day weekend, um, I'm in a group of 20 girls doing um, Sailor Scout Disney mashups. Um, And that is based on the art of an artist on Instagram called Miss Paige Christine. And her art, she just kept putting out these Disney sailor mashups and they were so good and so our group just kept growing and growing and growing and I think finally our photographer told us we couldn't add any more after 20 but we are we're all working on our sailor scout costumes and we're really excited about those I am also working on the new Bo Peep from Toy Story 4 Mm-hmm. Um, she gives me very Ray vibes with her staff and her cape. And, um, so I'm definitely, uh, definitely jumped all in on that one. So those I think are going to be my two biggest ones this year and maybe Mary Poppins and Jack still, we're still trying to squeeze those in. Okay. Which, uh, which Disney sailor are you going to be? I will be Princess Anna. One of my, one of my favorite recent princesses. I love Princess Anna. Agreed. She, uh, she is very much. She shares my hyper distracted, crazy excitement <laughs> about everything level. So I, I like her a lot. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I, I love it's one of the things I love from either cosplayers or the the artists that do them is when they do those mashups like Disney Jedi, like Disney Disney princesses that are Jedi or Sith or Sailor Scouts or these uh, characters going into like Doctor Who, or uh, like I think I saw Disney um, Game of Thrones characters. I would love stuff like that. I love just seeing just out there ideas. Yeah, and that's something I think I want to keep doing more mashups. Um, with my Ariel Ray mashup, I have, that has garnered a much warmer reception than I could ever have imagined. And I had so much fun with her. She, she was such a fun project to put together. And I, I think that I want to kind of keep looking at what else can I smush together and, and make look like a feasible costume and have fun with. So um, I think Sailor Anna is just the start. It's just the start of another slippery slope. Yes, that's it. <laughs> now, for the everyone who's listened, and if they're interested in finding you or seeing your projects and work and cosplay, on the internet, where can people go to find you? I am on Instagram as Danny B Dabbles, 
and um, that's where I post most of my content. So that would probably be the best place to follow. Okay, great. And I will have links to that on the show notes. And Danny, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to hang out with me today and talk fandom. And it has been a real treat to be able to to follow all of your work. And I'm really excited to see what you are going to be coming up with. Thank you so much for having me and um, for supporting my page. You've been awesome. So it's been a blast to be here for sure. Got to help those algorithms. Comment, <laughs> comment, comment, like, like, like. Comments. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Fandom. Subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcast app of choice. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Tales from the Fandom to see photos, links, leave feedback, and check out upcoming guests. If you'd like to be a guest, email David at talesfromthefandom at gmail.com.